Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. One of the uh, defining characteristics of the age we live in is the malleability and the vulnerability of identity. Whether we're looking at social networking sites like Facebook, where we construct our identities cumulatively over time and actually uh, adapt them also and change them, or whether we're looking at the concept of identity theft, the way our identities can be electronically stolen from us by others, or whether we're looking at our engagement with commodities and the way that commodities, in fact, offer us prepackaged identities that we can buy, that we can consume, and even that companies watch our buying patterns and construct identities on that basis, right? Uh, I think we'll agree that the politics of identity are being negotiated in the public sphere uh, perhaps now more than ever. What I'd like to focus on in, in the talk today uh, is more generally looking at identity and also how the arts intersect with it, and particularly music. Um, one of the ways that I introduce uh, the concept of identity to students is by having them create uh, a list of their identities. So here's a very partial list of my own identities, uh, using myself as a guinea pig here. Obviously not all of these are going to be on display all the time. I'm going to, depending on the context, the time and the place, uh, I'm going to emphasize certain habits within myself that accentuate a particular given identity. Uh, maybe based on the way I dress also, the way I speak, the way I might use music, among other uh, kinds of habits. So if we conceive of the self as our bodies and the total set of habits that are contained within our bodies at any given moment, then we can also uh, uh, think about how we accentuate different kinds of identities by the use of those habits. And when I might be teaching music in a classroom setting, uh, um, I'm drawing on the habits of a musician, but also a, of a professor. So there's a lot of overlap in those habits as well. That might be uh, one way uh, to think about it. Uh, so w some general things we might be able to say about identity is that it's a partial performance of the self. Identities are multiple within us. Uh, another statement, identities are strategic and imposed conscious and unconscious. I talked about the ways we might uh, strategically, consciously uh, shift our identities based on the kinds of habits we foreground. But identities are equally imposed and, and unconscious. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Thomas Torino, uh, who's done a lot of work uh, on identity at the University of Illinois, uh, told me a story of, of going to a bar outside of campus wearing a jeans and a t-shirt and taking his guitar along to play in that context. And, um, Someone in the crowd kind of went, uh, looked at him and, 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 and came up to him and said, Is there, by any chance, are you a professor? This person didn't know him, and he was clearly not trying to accentuate that identity, right? He was putting on a different identity, but there was something in his way of behaving, in his nonverbals, uh, that communicated that identity nonetheless. So it was very much we carry these habits unconsciously as well, uh, and they can be, these identities can be imposed upon us. If we were to try an exercise, not immediately, but maybe in the near future, try to find your 10 favorite songs, recordings, pieces of music from your life. It's a very challenging exercise, I think, for many of us. But one of the things uh, I think you'll find is that uh, identity is deeply connected to our, our core self, our identities, our experiences, our emotional life. Uh, it's part of how we define ourselves. So music is central to the formation of identities and selves. Um, it, point number four, music is central to the expression of group identities and social belonging. And I think this is an equally important area. Uh, if we were to look, for example, at um, the use of music in military settings, the use of music in our fraternities and sororities, the use of music in politics, those of you who've ever been to a political rally uh, would note how uh, a speaker addresses those present as, uh, and it kind of imposes a certain identity uh, voluntarily upon the, the, the people present as voters or as members of a political party. But music is really interesting in those kinds of settings. What is the purpose of music in the, the setting of a political rally? It's very interesting to note in some rallies you might hear country music being played. In other rallies you might hear R&B being played. And those are marking out communities, uh, both in the sense of who belongs and 
in a sense, who doesn't belong to those particular uh, communities in those spaces. Uh, so uh, that, I think, speaks to this point number four, music is central to the expression of group identities and social belonging. A lot of times um, when I talk to people who had profound musical experiences in their youth, and many of us uh, probably have had piano lessons or some kind of uh, in, involvement in music at a young age and then lost that connection. There's a yearning to connect again musically, to use the arts. And I think one of the barriers uh, that we face as a society in terms of engaging with the arts and engaging musically is the constructed identity of musician, uh, which is seen as a special type of person in our society. The musician is sometimes very celebrated as a figure, but can equally be seen as a kind of deviant um, or perhaps as a, a dreamer, a passionate kind of dreamer, not necessarily someone we would want our children to marry, right? Um, but uh, uh, even at CCM, in fact, in the conservatory environment where everyone is presumably shares that identity, there's, I think, a lot of anxiety about the, 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 the sense of belonging. Uh, and I think that is mediated in large part by this idea of talent that we have, that music is somehow inbuilt, innate. It's part of what we're born with and not something socially constructed, which is really how I see talent working. It's something that we, we also uh, construct as a society and impose. So um, this might uh, point to my last point here, that music is universal. The way it connects to our identities is a universal, but the idea of musicians as a separate category is not. One of the things ethnomusicology teaches us is that uh, in many societies around the world, whether we're looking at the Shona of Zimbabwe, the Aymara in the Peruvian Andes, uh, even our own local Mennonite church, um, being musical is an ethical responsibility. Everyone in the community has to engage musically in order to be part of that community. Now that we've performed our musician identities, uh, we can go on. That, uh, thank you, Jordan. Jordan Newman is one of our doctoral students in musicology. Um, so uh, the, the drums we've just played, the dol and the mao, are uh, found in every village in northern India, which is where I do my research, specifically in the region of Uttarakhand uh, in the Himalaya, Himalayan region. And these drums are found in lots of different contexts in that setting. Uh, they're played um, during ritual ceremonies to connect participants to gods and ancestral spirits. They're played in festival settings to allow everyone to dance in a participatory way. Uh, they're played to mark stages in a person's life from their birth to the, the ceremony in which they get their name to uh, their marriage to their passing. Um, these drums also mark time in a village, much like the uh, bell chimes here on our campus that mark every 15 minute interval. These drums are played early in the morning and they're played late in the evening to kind of structure the, the working day. Um, and the drums have also become a kind of regional emblem. Um, people from this region uh, identify these drums, which are very unique to this part of India, as part of the general 
cultural heritage as part of what it means to be from this region, their regional identity. But you might be surprised to, to, to learn that very few of those people would ever learn to play this drum or would ever want to play it. Um, it is identified with one specific community known as the Bajgi. And they, uh, there's no place that you could actually formally learn how to play these drums anywhere in that region, actually anywhere outside of CCM right now. Um, but uh, the, the, these drummers aren't passing it on to, to their children. It's a kind of decaying art form, uh, largely because of the stigma involved in, in playing these drums. And that stigma comes in large part because of, of having to handle animal skins, right, of animals that are considered sacred in this region. Pritam Bhardwan is uh, a member of this Bajgi community. Um, and, uh, knows all of the different drumming patterns that would be played in these various contexts. But over the past couple of decades, he has spent much more time in Delhi making recordings. He's now a very prolific recording artist. He's made uh, near about 50 uh, albums. And in that context, he expresses a completely different identity. He doesn't play uh, the drum at all. Whereas in the village, that's very much part of what his role is. Um, so music is very much mediating his presentation of self in these two contexts. Uh, what I um, have found interesting is in the last couple of albums that he's made, including this one, he's beginning to fuse these identities. So let's just briefly uh, look at a clip from uh, one of his uh, video albums. सासुर दूर मक्त बीज चंड बुंड दानों को शंगार कर आले लेदी माता सूच असीनाना ए बालों सूर्य कांठों में गे होली का गणेश बिजगिन मोरी का नारेन बिजगिन पंच नाम देवता बिजगिन लेली माता गंगा असीनाना Okay, so um, in the, even in this brief clip, uh, I think you'll notice a few things. Um, that are to me very striking. He, he, he's standing for one and not sitting, and he would be sitting in a, in a ritual context normally. He's also dressed in kind of conventional North Indian clothing, not dressed as a healer would. So he marks himself differently in that regard too. Uh, maybe most significantly, he's not wearing the dole, the drum here. Uh, in fact, there's two people, uh, two gentlemen off to the side that are performing that role. Uh, and something you may not have picked up from the audio in this room is that you're hearing two other drums that would be played in the studio setting. Actually, a lot, it, they're found in northern India, the tabla and the dolak, but you're seeing these village drums. So you're hearing and seeing different things. These are strategic choices that Pritham has made and that the producers of this album have made to, in a sense, accentuate certain aspects of the village regional identity, but also distance themselves from other uh, aspects that might be seen as more stigmatized, more stigmatizing, both to himself and to the production as a whole. Uh, so my point, uh, when, when I talk to people in, um, in this region who watch these videos and ask them their impressions, some of them can accommodate both of these identities. They can see preet them as both. But many people had a preconceived notion that he is a village drummer or he is a commercial star, and they were unable to see him in, in, in a sense, mediating those two identities and bringing them into conversation with each other. Similarly, this was either a, a village ritual or a commercial VCD, a commercial album, but it couldn't be both. Um, so my, my, my point in bringing this example in is to show how much he tries to manufacture his identity and how the commodity also mediates that experience based on the way that it's edited but also how people bring their own set of experiences to bear on how they interpret this and whether they can see him in one role or another. And this is an ongoing process. 
he came to UC this past October. I was able to invite Pritham Ji and he worked with some of our students. What was very fascinating in this context is that he embraced the drum. In fact, he didn't want to be called, introduced by me as a commercial singer, but as a drummer, a folk drummer. And it's not so surprising that that would bring a certain amount of cultural capital in this context. But it's an ongoing negotiation for him through his life. In fact, one of the things he said to me before leaving was, I want to take the drumming back to my village uh, and, and embrace it there because I serve as an example for other people like me. So this is something that's ongoing and, and process, processual, but he obviously adapts it depending on if he's in the village, in Delhi, or in Cincinnati. So to, to summarize, um, uh, I, I, I think the arts uh, in general, but particularly music, are very pivotal, very essential to both forming our identities and expressing them. Think about the, the last piece of music that you consciously chose to listen to or that you purchased. Why did you make that choice? Was it because of the innate qualities? Was there something just absolutely better about that than any other choice out there? Or did it reflect something about who you feel you are, who you may have been, or who you wish to be? Uh, I believe because music goes beyond just word-based thought, lexical thought, it taps into deep, profound, semiotic experiences that we can have, and thus it allows us to connect psychological aspects of ourselves emotional aspects, physical aspects, cultural aspects. Music allows us to feel whole, and it allows uh, communities to become visible to themselves. Music doesn't merely reflect identity, it expresses and forms it. Thank you.